U.S. Embassy opens in Jerusalem as John Kerry works overtime in Paris for the Iranians and against the United States. The U.S. Embassy opened in Jerusalem, now finally and formally recognizing that city as the capital of Israel, something the United States should have done decades ago. We should have always treated Israel as a strong ally. But of course, Barack Obama hated Israel. Barack Obama's heart and mind was with the aggressive Muslim nations surrounding Israel, the ones like Iran, to whom Barack Obama gave $1.8 million billion what the B? What am I thinking? Million, one point eight billion dollars in pallets of cash dropped off on a Turanian runway in the middle of the night. There's nothing shady about that, right? I mean, not like countries doing legitimate business, wire transfer or bank draft or you know do international money transfer. No, 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 no. You do, everybody drops pallets of cash off on a runway, don't they? Pablo Escobar found a way, <laughs> and El Chapo found a way to use electronic uh, bank transfers to their advantage, but not Obama. I mean, you know, Obama, Obama has to do it, you know, in the most shady way possible, then guaranteeing them another $150 billion. But the embassy opened in Jerusalem, and what the mainstream media is not showing you and telling you, now there are images all over the place, and I received images from some friends, but they asked me not to share them, friends who were there, because they were part of the U.S. delegation, and the angle of the images would have betrayed who they were. And they weren't authorized to release any images yet. But in one of the images they sent me, there's a bus, a bus, and it's wrapped. It has one of those promotional wraps on it. Thank you, President Trump. Israelis are waving flags. They're thanking the United States. Uh, this particular person told me there are Trump signs everywhere. Now, Netanyahu and Trump have been personal friends for a long time. But this was an alliance that needed to become rock solid again. The world is a very dangerous place. And without Israel as a partner, as a partner now that they are again in that region, it becomes even more dangerous. But, but some more anecdotal um, information on a friend who's there with the U.S. delegation told me that the mood is nothing but celebratory. Even in the areas near Gaza, near the Golan Heights, where there's uh, a lot of unrest right now, where there are attacks happening, and uh, the IDF actually stopped a terror attack. They're a bombing. The, 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 the Israelis have this renewed sense of hope. They're very upbeat. They're very positive because they know that the United States once again has their back. Look, they're always going to live in fear of attack. They're always going to live in fear of possible annihilation by the, by the aggressive Muslim nations around them. But at least now, at least now they know that they've got a strong ally in the U.S. Now, last week I had uh, former CIA station chief Scott Eulinger on the show, and he made a very interesting comment. And so I started asking people if they had seen the same. And Scott said he had operated against Iranian assets. And he said one of the things that the Arab Muslim nations won't tell you is that they see the Israelis as somewhat superhuman. Uh, the, uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, the Mossad, their intelligence services, because of the operations they pull off, the assassinations of really bad actors that they're able to undertake and carry out. And when I started asking around the people in, in uh, the intelligence community, the global law enforcement community, to a person, they said, oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, absolutely. There's this, this insecurity complex the Arabs have toward Israel, especially with regards to military and intelligence capabilities. But the Arabs also understood the, the uh, advantages of scale. There are just a lot more of them in the region than there are Israelis. And so that always put Israel, despite the surgical precision of the IDF, uh, excuse me, IDF and the Mossad, at a, at a disadvantage because mass and movement to uh, foundational doctrines of, of military power, of war, put Israel at that disadvantage. If you move enough bodies across somebody's border rapidly enough and you don't care about losses and you have wave after wave after wave coming, well, eventually you're going to do some damage. You're going to win. It's essentially how the Germans beat the, the much better equipped, much more well-trained, uh, how the R Russians rather beat the Nazis, Nazis being much better equipped, much more well-trained in World War II. It was just sheer numbers. They just kept running at them, even if the first line got mowed down and half of the second line could pick up a rifle and kill some Nazis and the third and the fourth and the... 300th. They just kept coming. And so Israel was always running the risk of that. Well, 
that risk is significantly mitigated with this renewed alliance with the United States. And so what they're telling me, those friends of mine who are there in the delegation, is that the mood is, is a renewed strength. They said even with the Israeli officials they're meeting with, whom they've known for years in, in the IDF and the intelligence community and the diplomatic corps, they now, they, they again don't have the concern they had. It's more of a proactive, uh, let's now move it forward. We're not, now Israel is not in a defensive posture. They're really starting to think about an offensive posture, a progressive posture with regards to their footing in the world. And, and I think that is nothing but outstanding. It makes the world a much safer place. Now, again, anecdotal to be sure, but these are people who have many, many years dealing with, with this on the intelligence side, the military side, the diplomatic side. People I'm talking to on, on the U.S. side of the world, their close friends and counterparts on the Israeli side. But back to the sentiment of the people. People have been celebrating for days. People on the American side started getting there last week. There are parties. There are, are these celebrations in the street. There are these gatherings. They're naming a park in Jerusalem after Donald Trump, small little park. But like I said, they told me this. He, one of the guys I know, he said to me, he said, I didn't know if I was in Jerusalem or Orlando. He said, part of this thing, like a Trump rally. They were holding signs, you know, Trump's face and Netanyahu's face. And then he, that's what he showed me the picture of the bus. He shared a, he texted me a photo of this bus. This bus just came running through and thank you, President. And Trump, the bus looked like a, it almost was like Trump wrapped it himself because the letters were like, you know, six feet high and it said Trump across the bus, like Trump likes to do to his own uh, properties and his planes and everything else. But man, isn't that great? Isn't it great that the United States has an ally in such a volatile region that isn't, that that ally isn't only because of the leaders of the United States and Israel having a good relationship and there being mutually beneficial geopolitical and economic reasons as to why those countries should be allied. Isn't it great that the people of Israel and the United States have such commonality that the people of Israel look to Donald Trump and say, we respect that guy. He's got our back. And many Americans, myself included, well, man, we breathe a, a collective sigh of relief when Netanyahu took the reins in Israel again. Finally, finally, Israel had somebody in power that understood the geopolitical situation in the world. And quick uh, digression and side note, when Netanyahu uh, wasn't in power, I had actually gotten on an Acela train <clears throat> from D.C. to New York. And I was the only person in the first class car of the Acela train. It's an Amtrak Acela. It's the train that runs a little bit faster between the Washington, D.C., New York corridor and the New York, Boston corridor. The speedy train to get you in about a half hour, 40 minutes faster. And uh, a couple of cops came on with dogs and they swept the train and they said, hey, we hope you don't mind. Can we look in your bag? We have uh, uh, somebody coming on the train. Uh, sure, whatever. Look in the bag. Boom, boom, boom. And uh, Netanyahu came on with one security guy and one aide. And we wound up chatting for about an hour. It's going back about, oh, 10 years or so. It just one of the most brilliant people I'd ever spoken to. A uh, very nice man. But it was, uh, you know, one of those little moments in history. You don't forget in your own personal history. But my takeaway from that was this is a very competent, very brilliant guy. And, uh, but also westernized, Americanized. It was very easy for me as a guy from New York to just on a, you know, man to man level relate to Netanyahu. And I think that's why there's this uh, empatico between him and Donald Trump and why Americans and Israelis are in many respects uh, able to get along so well. There's a lot of similarity especially from a city in America. So this is really an alliance we need, much like, and I would argue in, in many respects, coming from New York with a large Jewish population, now living in South Florida with a large Jewish population, having many Jewish friends, I probably have more in common with Israelis than I do with someone from, say, London, um, just culturally. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting alliance we have there, and one that I hope we keep for many, many years. Now, one person, who doesn't understand that alliance is John Kerry, former Secretary of State. John Kerry has been lobbying on behalf of Iran. Now, last week, I read you the Logan Act, and I, I, after each sentence, I essentially uh, explained what John Kerry did, and it was so identical to what would violate the statute. It, it, it so perfectly, I should say, violated the statute. It was almost as if John Kerry was walking around with, with, with a copy of the Logan Act and going, okay. So this is what I would do to violate sentence one of the Logan Act and did it. All right, let me get my script out. Oh, okay. Sentence two of the Logan Act. And he did it. And it was like he violated the Logan Act on purpose, 
on purpose. And uh, well, John Kerry did it again. He did it again because just over the weekend, he was caught meeting with Iranians in Paris. He didn't have security detail. How was he caught? Well, an American was sitting in the restaurant and took photos of him doing it. They actually have photographs of John Kerry trying to subvert the United States of America on behalf of the Iranians. And I'm going to tell you all about this. I'm also going to give you the names of the Iranians he met with. Yep, they've been identified. Jason Osborne, former Trump advisor, put some of the photos out on Twitter. His friend was in the restaurant and took the photos. And uh, Twitter uh, users from the Middle East identified these people. They compared photos of the names that they uh, had identified. It's clearly them because uh, they got full front on facial photos. Clearly them. I'm going to tell you who these people were. I'm going to tell you all about that meeting on my longer show, Off the Cuff Declassified, today, right here on The Rebel. I want to keep bringing you this content every day, so help me do it. Subscribe to our premium service at www.therebel.media forward slash shows. Also, go to the App Store, download the great Rebel app, and go to firescottisrael.com. As always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.